Eva Jane Savelle Bolance, World War II, Iwo Jima. Eva Jane Bolance, I interviewed her in Las Cruces, New Mexico, 2006. She's a part of my Iwo Jima film that is shown on my Voices of History channel. And I, I just love this lady. She's in her mid 80s when I interviewed her in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And just a sweetheart and the stories that she told me. She was a surgical nurse before the war and then entered the military, the Navy Nurse Corps in 1943. Ended up in the South Pacific for about a year and she took care of casualties from some of the island fighting, including Iwo Jima, the infamous battle of Iwo Jima in 1945. And one of the most memorable stories I have of Eva Jane is how she used to hold the hands of the wounded and dying Marines and just really touched my heart. Sometimes all the Marines wanted, all the wounded wanted was someone to hold their hand. So, but very special thank you to Angie Simmons, wife of Vietnam veteran Terry Simmons for sponsoring this story so you can see this on my Voices of History channel. Uh, Angie, thank you for your love and support. Thank you, Terry, I love you guys and you're making it possible for many people to learn about history. Folks, every page of history lost, these stories become more precious and more valuable. So Angie, thank you. And if you'd like to sponsor one of these stories, you that are watching these videos, a lot of you watch my videos, please consider sponsoring a story. I have many of them. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes resources to do this, and I need your help. Let's get these stories out there. Many of you have been really touched and blessed. Please help me. Um, bring these stories forth. There's information in the video description, so you could use that. Or contact me, and let's get you on the list. Amen. There's lots of stories, lots of stories that need to be told, especially in this day. So thank you for watching, and I want to invite you to share these links with others, and um, just spread the word, folks. This is history. This is firsthand accounts of what happened, and I'm happy to have my documentary series, Lest They Be Forgotten, featured on the Voices of History channel as a part of the online museum that I've created, the National Military History Online Museum. So God bless you, thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you again. picture of it? Well, we'll get you a copy of it. All right, thank so, you. Well, I'll get your address before you leave today and we'll mail, mail you that information. Oh, well, that will be nice of you. Let's just talk a little bit about <clears throat> your involvement as a nurse in the Army. We're going to only talk in about... In the Navy. In the Navy, okay. We're only going to talk 30 or 40 minutes. So <clears throat> tell me what group, unit, uh, division, who were you with in the Navy? And, uh, what your rank was and your actual job was. Just give me a little bit of information there. Were you with, uh, were you, like in the Army, they have battalions and regiments. So what group were you with in, the, in World War II? Well, I joined the Navy at Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I was working as an operating room nurse at the University of Pennsylvania. And I saw the signs, oh, I need you, I need you, Uncle Sam. And so one day I went in and signed on the dotted line. And I received a letter from the Navy saying, in uh, 10 days, you will report to the United States Naval Hospital, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for basic training. And, uh, oh, w w which I did. And uh, at Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, oh, we had our basic training where we learned uh, Navy jargon, and uh, which I won't have to tell you about, right? And where we learned how to tell time, it was differently. Midnight was 0012. And uh, where we learned, um, it was so funny, if we had to go and get a drink of water, we went to the scuttlebutt, you know. And the floor was the deck, and the dining room was the mess hall. And we learned how to march there. Mm -hmm. Because at the, it was, uh, Philadelphia was called the city of brotherly love. And uh, I will tell you one thing, the Navy, was very proud of their nurses. They, they really were. They put us up front a lot of times. And uh, 
we, the, we had a warrant officer that was teaching us how to march. And uh, some dignitary was in town for a couple of days in the city. And uh, we could go to the uh, rear march, we could go into the right march very, very well. But when, he when we were going to the right flank and the left flank, we went really all over the place. And he put his hand on top of his head and he said, you nurses can really march, but you, ca I, uh, you, re you nurses can't march, but you really can dance. And he put his hand on top of his head and when he did his hat and his toupee came off. Oh, he was so embarrassed. But, and then from Mo, Philadelphia, I uh, was assigned to Great Lakes, Illinois at Waukegan. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we, um, it was, we still were, were in hospitals that were, you know, oh, stone structured, I would say. And just wards like a regular hospital that we would have in the city of Las Cruces here. And uh, it was just routine nursing care where the, oh, the sailors were convalescing. Well, in about three months, I received my orders for uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, we were given uh, a three or a four day leave to go home. And uh, we returned back to, uh, uh, to Great Lakes. And from there, we, uh, I think we flew to San Francisco to the St. Francis Drake Hotel. And at the hotel there, uh, we were told we had to log in and log out wherever we le whenever we left the hotel because we did not know the hour or the time when we were going to board a ship and go to Pearl Harbor. And um, our, we had to uh, have our foot lockers, which was our luggage, mm -hmm. uh, ready at all time. And so one morning, I'm telling this very cons briefly, you know, yeah, yeah. One morning at uh, 0030, that was 3 o'clock in the morning, telephone rang, we will be ready to leave in 45 minutes. So we put on our uniforms, stood outside of the, our hotel room, and our foot lockers were there. And of course, we were first before that we, if it, when this occurred, we were not even to make a whisper. We were to stand at complete attention. And a, a Navy officer came up to greet us, and we went down the steps of the hotel very quietly, single file, went down the steps to the basement, and, th and through a very dark tunnel. And at the opening of this tunnel was the largest ship that I ever saw in my life. And the, we, we aborted the ship, and you know, we could, oh, it was so hard not to talk. Where are we going? And this, we boarded the ship, and the ship uh, went out with no noise, hardly, you know, no, what do I want to say? No greeting, no goodbyes or anything, no adieus. And it took, us, it took us seven days, oh, and I think six nights to reach Hawaii. And on the ship, I don't remember the name of it, but there were Red Cross workers, Navy personnel of all ranks, and, uh, um, it, uh, um, I just happened to be one of those that, at that time, the ships weren't stabilized. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very hard to, you know, you were sick. And I was on the third bunk with just a little bucket of apple for, for, for three days. But after that, I was all right. And the Red Cross uh, gave us entertainment every night. And we all sang, and we were just one big happy family. When we arrived at, uh, at Pearl Harbor, uh, we were greeted and, uh, with, and we all got into Jeeps, which had never rode one before, you know, and was sort of a lady like trying to get into one. But, uh, and we were taken to our base hospital number eight. There, there were no longer one big hospital. They were all little wood structure wards with maybe just 12 to 18 patients in one ward. And uh, our quarters were Quonset huts. Those the steel structure buildings that the officers, of, you know, I mean, the of World War II veterans are know know what they are. And uh, my roommate happened to be Marie Rossi from Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And we didn't have beds; we had cots, little little spring mattresses. It was really different, you know, and. Um, uh, I was an operating room nurse, 
But oh, at uh, Pearl Harbor yet, I uh, just just did, uh, like general duty. We were in charge of a ward, and I will tell you this one thing: we had corpsmen, and my corpsmen were. I never had a bad corpsman. They were just excellent. You treat them right, and they'll treat you with the utmost respect. And we got along just fine. At Pearl Harbor, we were uh, had a few lessons of oh. Uh, uh, in a short time, you will be shipped to a uh, uh, further duty, which isn't going to be Pearl Harbor. And we were um, drilled and trained in uh, what we should do in emergencies with uh, uh, maybe 150, 200 patients, how we should, uh, what we should do. We were never to shed a tear. And uh, oh, it's hard to remember what else. Oh, oh, and then at Pearl Harbor, there happened to, Heckam Field was at Pearl Harbor. And it just happened that the General, oh, oh, five-star General Omar Bradley was uh, up at Pearl Harbor, up at uh, Heckam Field, and he became ill. And uh, they just had a small dispensary, but he needed to be hospitalized. So they had shipped the five-star General Army down to Base Hospital 8, where I was a nurse. And three of us were chosen to be his uh, special nurses. And I was chosen to be his morning nurse. Well, that was an honor indeed. And he was one, and I, the first day I went in, I said, you know, five-star General Bradley, I'm, I'm a little nervous. And he said, oh, well, don't be. He said, my goodness. <clears throat> but he, he was so sick. And um, he was one of the nicest patients that you would ever want to be. And he kept me on <clears throat> even after our recuperating stages. And we would go every day out to the islands to uh, an estate. And two great Dane dogs would meet us. And we would go in and, and he would have classical music played and we had tea cookies. And it, it, was, it was just an honor. You go out with, a, with the Jeep with five stars on it and everybody saluting you, you know, with your white starched uniforms that we had, with our caps. And, um, well, um, <clears throat> and then at Pearl Harbor, there was, um, oh, that was at the end of 40, beginning of 43, I was there, I believe. And then in the mail one day, there was oh, an order from, from here in um, two or three days, you will proceed to oh, the island of Guam, the Mariana Islands. And uh, we hurried and got an atlas to see where Guam was and where we were. And I have a picture of it in the book here. And um, we, we flew to, uh, oh, in, uh, I think it was a B-12 where we had to get up in the belly of the plane and just set along the edges and the, and the uh, middle of the plane was uh, completely bare. We, the nurses just sat on the side. When we uh, uh, embarked on the, on the island of uh, Guam, uh, I, I, I think it was Tumon Bay. Now, I'm not sure, but um, that was Base Hospital 18. And there again, uh, that was quite a disaster area in back in 1944 and 45. I was there for two years with no liberty for two years. And, uh, but you know, you're just 22, 23 years old. And I don't know, you had the three V's of vigor and vitality, you know. And um, um, the, again, the wards were uh, just uh, wood structured wards, maybe with just 10, 12, 14 patients. And I was an operator. I, since I had my operating room oh, experience, I was in the operating room, an operating room nurse. And oh, um, we were, oh, all we had in our room was just one foot locker, three, oh, two, oh, three decker beds, three of us, you know, in a bunk bed. We met some CBs and they, they made us oh, uh, Chester drawers. And if that wasn't nice, instead of just a foot locker, well, uh, here is where our instructions at Pearl Harbor certainly came in handy. Uh, we would often be called down to the beachhead, maybe uh, at uh, three o'clock in the morning or midnight. Oh, uh, and then at at Guam, we were 
uh, we were uh, we didn't we no longer wore our white uniforms, but we wore our caps, and uh, we were uh, our uniforms then were gray seersucker. Oh, I forgot to tell you when we went when I was indoctrinated into the Navy, I was an ensign, and at Pearl Harbor then I became a lieutenant junior grade. So I was a lieutenant junior grade when we went to Guam. And at three o'clock in the morning, we'd be called down to the beachhead, and maybe a hundred, I will say that many, 50 or a hundred, uh, uh, Marines would come in from the islands of Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Japan. And uh, they, they were uh, coded. As I would say, oh, the, the nurses were there, the corpsmen were there, and the doctors were there. And the doctors would examine the patient, maybe put a red label on him, and say, well, this one has to go to the operating room immediately. I wasn't always in the operating room because we had, there were several of us seeing, so, so sometimes I was down at the beachhead at this terrain. And uh, the red ones would go up to for emergency treatment. They all received plasma before they got up because plasma can be given to anyone. And um, then they had the green, that uh, they, they could uh, go to a ward. And you know, these Marines, they, they could hardly walk themselves, but they would uh, make a chair out of their arms and put a, a, a Marine that couldn't walk so well in their arms here and, care, and take them up that way to the ward where they were supposed to go. And then they had the yellow tag, and those were ones that had, those were the Marines that had to go to the wards, and the nurses, would, the nurses on the ward then would bathe them, take off their, you know, oh, give them their oh, garb that they were supposed to wear and treat them, and the doctor, how, you know, how you were supposed to treat them then, emergency. And then there were the ones that were oh, DOA, dead on arrival. And I just want to tell you that they were treated with the greatest respect. The, they were, a white cloth was placed over them and, and their dog tags were put out over the, the, the white cloth. And everybody had to wear a dog tag and we were never allowed to take them off because on the dog tag, it must have been like a computer information, your serial number, which mine was 12045, no. I could for, see I was able to recite it like my social security number, but it was the, your your um, number on there could identify who you were in Washington, and then when you had your last tetanus shot, and uh, what your uh, rank no the rank was it on but uh, your last tetanus shot, and uh, whether you were oh your religion, and maybe I don't know what else, and. Um, and then another thing, uh, we always, oh, I, in the operating room then, the night before the patients, oh, we had so many amputees. It was, you know, um, you know, penicillin wasn't discovered till 1942. And when we have to put, pen, we didn't have intermuscular injections in a penicillin. And the penicillin was in a quart jar, and it was a mold. And we had to get our sterile, our gloves and sterile forceps. Take go, take the jar off before the lid off of the jar before we put our gloves and sterile forceps. Then we would take those our sterile forceps and take the um, the mold out of the jar and put on the patients. Oh, you know, whatever they needed the penicillin put on. But uh, this is very interesting too. At um, if the, patient, if the Marine was to have his leg amputated the next morning, his leg, you know how a pig trough is? Their leg was placed in a wooden pig oh, trough lined with ice. And then the, oh, we, at, the, at the foot of the bed was a bucket, and we always put a towel there so then when the ice melted, they wouldn't hear the drip. And that leg was in that ice all night to numb it. So it would be easy, you know, it wouldn't have to be so much anesthesia in the morning. We didn't rig on anesthesia, but we had to conserve it whenever we could. And you know, many, um, almost every time, the, pay, the, the, the Marine would say, Miss Sable, that was, my, that was my name in the service, Sable. Miss Sable, would you please have the doctor come in in the morning? Maybe my leg doesn't have to be amputated. And I said, he certainly will. And the doctors always came in in the morning to see the patient. They would never do that. And their arms would have to be placed in a trough too. 
And of course, so, you know, it's just a regular saw that you saw the leg off with, and uh, it was so sad. One of the worst patients that I ever saw was this boy from Teaneck, New Jersey, was just maybe about 21 years old. He didn't even have a beard yet. And he came in, and he was on the red alert, but he was, his chin was so shot off, and he must have been on the battlefield for a couple weeks before they picked him up. And his whole mouth was full of worms, of maggots, and his tongue was eaten off. And uh, we took him then into the room off of the operating room and put him in a tub of warm water in order to take his clothes off and to get this, uh, these worms out of his mouth. And uh, he, he lived for two days, but, and he was off. Of course, off of the operating room was like an ICU room. We would keep these patients, and he would look up at you with those big blue eyes. Thank you. And you know, you shed a tear. I don't, we weren't allowed to, but I did in a way. And uh, he died in two days. But uh, that was one of the worst patients that I ever saw. I was going to say something else, too. Now, these are, some of these Marines are from Iwo Jima? And Okinawa, Japan. Yeah, but all from both places. And then some of the men that were, some of the Marines that were on the battlefield maybe for 10 days or 11 days before they were brought to our, our, to our beachhead in order, you know, some of them would go to the island. Of, no, this was going to be later now. They, they, when they would come, you couldn't possibly take their clothes off because they were with the excreta, with the fecal material or blood secretions, you know, or vomitus. We had to put them in tubs oh, in order to oh, loosen the clothing because you, you couldn't take them off. So those were some of the atrocities of that. Oh, you know, we were just busy, maybe 14 hours we worked, you know, and some, some food was brought to us, but. I don't know, you just didn't get hungry, you know. It was just, and, um, but, and then some of the care was just routine care after that. And do you know at, at Guam, I remember this, and there were Japanese prisoners there. And in the daytime, I don't know where they stayed at night, but in the daytime, they're, they're, they were, oh, chained somehow to the outside of the ward we would so they would get some fresh air and uh, that that would you know we were so afraid of them in a way because they would talk as we would go along you know in, in, in Japan in Japanese or well anyway in 1944 uh, the USS Indianapolis the, the transport ship uh, left Pearl Harbor and it had uh, the atomic bomb and was on its way to Hiroshima to be detonated. And it left Pearl Harbor, went, went through Grom, and it was detonated, detonated and there were 1,200 uh, Navy personnel aboard that ship. Captain McVeigh was the captain. And uh, on the way back, uh, they were coming through Guam, and a Japanese uh, torpedoed ship uh, had six torpedoes, the book said, but uh, it, it bombed the ship uh, at uh, 345 00 one morning, and it split the ship in half in three minutes. And there were 500 men, 500 sailors and personnel, you know, that were lost their life immediately. And the others were oh, thrown into shark-infested waters where they stayed for four to five days, can you imagine? And oh, those boys, the stories that, they didn't want to relate it to us, but sometimes they, they had to get it off my chest, that they had to tell somebody. And oh, they said that when they would waken up in the morning, you know, they were on, on maybe they were in potato crates, some of them were able to get life lifeboats, and some of them were able to get uh, life, you know, the life jackets. And they said when they got up in the morning, there were always sharks that were around their potato crate or their, and uh, they could, they could all sometimes the sharks would just be having a Roman holiday. They you could just see them 
biting their head off and taking them down in the water. And the, the blue water turned to red water. They would relate to us. And um, Vincent Howard, who I was very fortunate to, for to have my picture taken by the naval photographer. Oh, his, na his oh, name is mentioned several times in arm's way and all the sailors died. But oh, these sailors were in the water and um, personnel for, as I say, four to five days. Captain McVeigh just happened to be in a potato crate and uh, he heard someone crying one day, help me, help me. And here it was Vincent Howard. And he drug him into his potato crate. And uh, it, those, the, the men said that for, they would just, um, after five days, they became delirious. They had what you call photophobia. They thought they saw somebody and they didn't. And uh, I guess the one man said he was, saw an arm in the water and he thought he, that was, he was going to raise him up. And just when he was going to raise the arm up, a shark came and cut his arm off. And those boys, I call them boys, those men, that they would shed a tear sometimes when they would talk to us. And um, me, one day... I wanted to go back just a bit now. The, well, I'm really interested in the Iwo Jima because my film is on Iwo Jima. Oh, good. And, but so I, I'm interested in all of this, but I'm really intrigued by what you told me about working on Guam with these Marines. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the picture that you present with your story is it's incredible, Eva Jane. And, and, you know, my experience has been working with the, the Marines that were on Iwo Jima. In fact, two weeks ago, I was in Guam and on Iwo Jima. Really? I went, I went on a trip. I've got pictures, but it was an amazing trip. But I went with some of the men that fought on that island 61 years ago. So as you're telling me this story, I wanted to go back just a minute again with those wounded on Iwo, from Iwo and Okinawa. Um, I mean, that had to have been a very um, difficult time for you. You said it was sad when they amputated limbs. I mean, oh, yeah. Were you, what about just any more interaction you had with these? Did you talk with them about their families, about their home life? Did any of them tell you how they were wounded? or? Did you no, hear stories like that? no, but I know that they came in from Okinawa and Iwo Jima, Japan. Guam was about here, and Iwo Jima and Okinawa, Japan, like like here, and they were flown in. But sometimes, oh, the, the USS Tranquility ship was busy. You know, they would transport these patients from uh, from Okinawa and Iwo Jima, Japan, evidently, to the the waters in, in Guam here. You know. Where, where Guam was, and they would take them to the island of Palia, P-I-E-L-I-E-U. Palau? Palau. They would take them to the USS Tranquility, or else they were airlifted to the island of Palau. That, but that was just a, an emergency oh, little hospital, I guess. That's all I know about it. But then the, the USS Tranquility then would bring these patients Oh, to the beachhead at Guam, and then we would care for them there because we had a lot better facilities for them. But uh, when we would get, oh, but that's all I know about that. So there were there were a lot of wounded. Oh yes, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of amputees. It was so sad. It was every day almost. Was it hard to? Uh talk about it after the war or did you talk about it you know not not too much because um oh you know oh we were honored in the navy the, but the because they couldn't have done without navy nurses that's for one thing i'm that conceited about that and uh, so the doctors treated us with utmost respect the naval officers but after the war oh we didn't get any attention at all, no, not not to march any place or anything. But since I've been in Las Cruces, I've spoken at the Uni uh, Pearl Harbor week. I I spoke almost every day at the university and the schools and things like that. Tell, tell me, just briefly, tell me about this picture. Who who was in the picture and where that's at? Well, I was telling you, he was the one that said, save me, save me. And McVeigh picked him up out of the water and put him in his potato crate. And uh, he went to the island of Palua first. 
and then he was brought to base hospital 18. And he just happened to be in my ward. And uh, the naval hosp of the naval photographer, I have the picture from the paper too, and uh, he said, you come over here. I don't, I don't know how it was, but anyway, oh, I had my watch on and he had his watch on. He said, oh, you take my watch and, and you know, take, take my picture. He took his watch off and I was holding it because my watch is always on my wrist. And uh, afterwards, we did talk a little bit, but we were so busy, we did, really didn't have time to converse too much. But um, his name is in, in harm's way in, in many and many a pages there, Vincent Howard. And I really should have called him up and, and you know, talked to him as soon as I read the book and everything, but I didn't. Wondered where he was, and it would have been so nice to have been acquainted with him again. Tell me, tell me why you think this is important to tell your story for the women that have served. Why, why do you think that's important? Oh, what is a nurse? Mm -hmm. A nurse is just a human being like you are. But a nurse has compassion, she has feeling, and um, oh, just a smile and a, and a gentle touch and say, good morning, how are you? Oh, and. Um, I, I, I'm so glad that I was born, that I, I was able to be a Navy nurse and to take care of, of these oh, oh, Marines and sailors. It, it has been a privilege, and I, I will never forget it. And uh, um, after, this, after the service, after I was discharged, I received my degree in nursing, and I taught pediatrics for 13 years in Pennsylvania. And, um, um, oh, I'll, I'll have to tell you something else, too. On the wards, whenever, we didn't operate every day. As I say, there was a change of nurses, too, because you couldn't stand it to see all that, you know, blood in every day and amputations every day. But, um, uh, we, I would be on the ward just right off there, and we would have to shave the patients. And we didn't have razors, and we just had straight razors. And so I went in and I said, um, Charlie, oh, I think I'll shave you today. And he said, oh, that would be wonderful, Miss Sable. So I came in with this sheet and with this strap and this razor, and he said, with a straight razor? He said, have you ever done that before? I said, oh, sure, lots of times. So I shaved him, but you know, when they were saying they saw that straight razor, they were so afraid. <laughs> it was so funny. Oh. But oh, it was happy days too there in a way, whenever they would go on the hospital ship and, you know, go home. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, you, did you pray for any of those Marines back then? I mean, you remember doing anything like that? Or? Well, you know, I can't say that I remember, but I'm a, I'm a Christian, and, and I'm sure that when I knelt and said my night prayers, I did. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We're almost out of time, but I want to ask you a couple other questions. Um, what, what does the American flag mean to you as a veteran? What does the American flag mean to you? You know, I was never asked that question before, but it's the most beautiful flag there is, and it means democracy freedom of speech, and uh, when, when it flies, you get shivers, you get goose pimples. It's, 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 um, it's America, and uh, I, I fought, I helped fight for America. I helped it to be a better place for you and for me, and the American flag always flew at all of our stations the red, white, and blue. And we had to salute it every morning. Oh, we had chapel, and oh, the American flag was always there. And it always meant, I'm so proud to be an American. What would you tell a young person today about the price for freedom when they know nothing about war, and yet you saw the sacrifices that were made for our country. What would you tell a young person today about the price for freedom? You know, it's like uh, if you'd go to Utah and see the red, oh, for, red oh, formation, the rock formation, 
you couldn't explain it to anybody. You could just tell them what it was, and there were different formations. And uh, what, what we did, we did because we wanted to from our heart. Oh, we, we didn't do it to be made known. We, at 21 years old, you didn't even think about those things. We did it because we wanted to, to help people. And that, I guess that's... Uh, well, no, that's, that's kind of what, you know, you, you saw the sacrifice to keep our country free, the, the young men that died and that were oh, wounded. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the, pro the freedom's not free, you know? Freedom is not free. There's a price to pay for our freedoms. Yes, there is. You, you never know what, what those Marines went through in World War II because you weren't there. It's uh, how they suffered. Some of them would come in and their, their toes were just like leather. They were just all gangrened. And of course they had to have, a, a, you, the, the pain was excruciating. And that had to be almost an emergency oh, amputation. And uh, even if just your hand had to be amputated on, the, on one of the Marines, that, that was uh, just as hard as a leg, you know. And of course, after an amputation, you know, the first three days after an amputation, you always have panthen pain. And the, oh, the Marines should go and give them their morning care and then give them their bath and oh, wash their head or wash their hair or something like whatever you were doing for them. And they'd say, oh, would you please give me something for the pain in my toes or my leg? And it was amputated for a couple of days already. And, you, you know, I tried to change the subject. I can remember, you know, oh, how many sisters did you say you had or how many brothers, you know? And then maybe the pain would go away, but that pain always, see, the nerves were severed and they weren't quite healed yet. Um, well, that's very traumatic for a young person to lose Oh, a you, I can imagine, I don't know. If you know, oh, you don't know what it's like until you've walked in their footsteps, like the old Indian saying, you know, you, you don't know. Yeah. Did you feel good about your day? Did you go to bed sleeping, feeling good about what you did? Or were you, did you cry yourself to sleep? How did you process all of that no, stuff you saw? I, I never cried myself to sleep. I, I, I was an only child, and I never did anything on my own, and I was just proud <laughs> you know, you know, that, that I did those things. And I, um, I was always anxious to get to on duty the next morning or the next evening. We had shifts that we had to work, three shifts. And I was always anxious to go go on duty. You know, those little gray or sucker uniforms. And we had to wear combat boots, and I remember they were men's sizes, and I wore a size four, you know, because it was awful. It was muddy over there. They had a lot of them. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. What about the doctors? Um, what do you have to say about the, the surgeons that were in Guam doing all the surgeries? Were they good, good surgeons? Oh, they might. You know, I... Were you in the operating room with them? Oh, oh yes. Oh, so I was an instrument nurse. Can you just describe a surgery in that? And, you know, just, just a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what you did and what the doctors did and the patients. Well, if we knew the leg was to be amputated, the nurse from the ward would bring them in, and uh, that, then we would, uh, you know, put the antiseptic on it and give them their, the anesthesiologist would give them the, oh, the anesthesia. And oh, the instrument nurse would just, oh, you know, you have to scrub for 10 minutes. And oh, then we'd, oh, un, un, would some, someone would help us with our sterile gloves. And then we'd just go into the operating room and uh, somebody would just put the sheets there and we'd take the sheets out and after they were paint, after their leg was, we say painted, they always painted, but put, you know, put the methylate on or whatever it was at, at that time, put the uh, sheets on and, uh, and have, just get the instruments out on the tray. You just had to know just what the doctors needed. After a while, you, you know, you could almost, you couldn't do it yourself, but you knew what, you had to know what instruments the doctor needed. And they would say, 
just I want the number two hemostat or the number four hemostat or I want the um, uh, the number four scissors, some, uh, something like that, and or the saw. Oh dear, and uh, we just they were all we had a lot of claves there though where they you know we had to uh, a lot of clave the instruments and we and then of course we had oh when you would go. When the doctors would oh, cut in, into the skin, and of course there there would be the blood, and we had to have the right hemostat ready to oh, so the doctor could oh, clamp the hemost uh, would clamp the blessel to stop it from bleeding, and uh, it was that would have been difficult without see. nurses. Yes, it would have been. Yeah. You, yeah. you you provided the care, the love, the support, and. I'm sure after an amputation, the, the patient would have been traumatized. Oh, I can, I, you know, I can just imagine. I, uh, yes. And then they had so to go many, home. Did you ever think about their families, how they're going to adapt to life and, and society? You know, and all that? I will tell you this. After uh, one of my corpsmen was named Bill Moe, and he was from Teaneck, New Jersey. He was one of the best corpsmen. Oh, and, oh I really like that boy. We weren't allowed to date off, you know. We had, we were told you just have to date officers, but he was the nicest boy. And uh, I was go had to go to Chelsea, Massachusetts. That was a naval base, and I was going. It was just a little must have been out of the way, but I don't know. I went to Teaneck, New Jersey, to visit him, and uh, uh, his mother greeted me with open arms, and and I met him again, and it was. That, but that's the only thing I you can't remember after 65 years or so. It's hard. When they had an amputation, were they fitted with a prosthesis then? No, they didn't no. Have them then, uh -uh. They? No. Yeah. They were just wrapped. Uh, this the stump was just uh, wrapped with gauze, and uh, then of course, see, this was at Guam. It was, you know, we were many, many miles from Pearl Harbor, and. Uh, after they were able to, they either went to, to to Pearl Harbor on the USS Hope, another hospital ship, or else they were airlifted. And then at Pearl Harbor, they would either um, oh, maybe be shipped, probably shipped to the States. I don't know if they had prosthesis there or not. I have no idea. Are you proud that you served our country? Oh, yes, yes. I'm so glad that... Uh, that uh, that I had the privilege of signing on the dotted line. <laughs> yes, very much so. It's it's quite an honor, and I'm 84 years old now, and um, oh, just um, I I cry more now than I did before because of our boys in Iraq. But our, I call them boys yet, are but. Um, it's, it's, you, you'll never know what they went through, never. Those poor Marines from Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. what, what did you know about Iwo Jima at the time, anything? No, nothing, <laughs> no. You were just treating casualties, you didn't know anything about that? No, not that I remember. I, w I have the, I, we had maps and we could see where Titan was, you know, and uh, um, after the, they said that we were getting patients from the USS in Annapolis. Why, so I remember when the six of us went to our room, we said, what was the USS in Annapolis? I've heard about it, you know. And so, oh, I don't know how we got information, but we, oh, you know, talked about it and said, well, the casualties are in Palau now, and we'll be getting them here in a couple of days. And, uh, you know, and some of those, they just lifted those boys, they said, those Marines, out of the water. And uh, they, were, they, were, they were so eaten away by, by sharks, they couldn't even, oh, you know, do a, 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 they couldn't even have an identification. So they were, the word was sent home that they were missing in action. And I must say this at the end, oh, what, what is your name? Larry. Larry, I must say this at the end, Larry, that Captain Mavay in no way oh, should have been charged for the, torp should, for the death of those, oh, all of those Marines. They said that he zigzagged the ship in order to be zigzagged. 
he had sent SOS messages out, and he had sent all kinds of what, what they had on the ship. And nobody, the ship was missing for five days and nobody wondered where it was. They didn't even come to find out. And it was a, oh, a naval officer by the name of Gwynn, G-W-I-N-N, -N, that was just out on a flying cruise, I guess. And uh, he, he was flying over Guam and he looked down in the water and um, he saw like a uh, tar down there, black, and he thought, well, whatever could that be? And um, he lowered his, he lowered the plane, and here, here he saw men in, in boats and in uh, all kind of crates just hanging on to each other. And uh, so he wired back or something to, to Guam, and they came out, and uh, they, uh, took these men then to Palua, either on the USS Tranquility ship or airlifted them. But uh, McVeigh in no way should have been court-martialed and stripped of his rank. And he committed suicide, you know, too bad, at his home. Such a lovely, he was a patient at, at the base hospital 18, but I, 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 I didn't take care of him and I, I didn't even see him there. But I know it was just the scuttlebutt around that he had no way did he uh, was in charge, you know, for those all of those so men to be uh, drowned. Well, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. Yes. Where at the end of the interview, I ask all of the veterans to do this. I've interviewed over 200 World War II veterans. Oh, good. And as a woman, I'm, ask, I'm going to ask you to give me a salute into the camera when I tell you to. All Would right. Would that be okay? Yes. Okay. Okay, right into the camera. Great, thank you. Okay. <laughs>